basically concentrate on the thoracic spine now. So this uh, talk is going to begin by Dr. Rick Bransford and on the uh, thoracic uh, pedicle screws. <clears throat> Thanks. So uh, we're going to talk, uh, again, kind of focusing on deformity, uh, a screw versus a hook. What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? And uh, look a little bit at the safety profile um, of these. And of course, there's lots of controversy, and we'll try and go over some of that. I thought we were going to have a little interactive things, and we don't. Um, and so I guess uh, just a show of hands, um, looking at these four different options for thoracic instrumentation, who in the audience would say, I would put a pedicle screw? Obviously, there's differences and differences in size of kids and that kind of stuff. But who here would be willing to put a pedicle screw anywhere from T1 down to T12? OK, so basically everybody. OK. So that's, that's interesting, and, and uh, we'll look back at it a little historically. I guess we don't have to go through the next two options or the next three options because basically everybody raised their hand. And who in the audience would say that after placing thoracic pedicle screws for deformity, fracture, tumor, whatever, who would say, I always check a CT scan afterwards to see where my screws are? Okay, so about six, six, seven. Who would say um, they check only in deformity patients where there's a lot of kind of variability in the, in the, in the angle of the vertebral bodies? Okay, so about three or four. And who would say if the patient is okay when they wake up, no pro complications with surgery, um, I'm okay with my C-arm pictures, my x-ray pictures, um, I, I don't check a CT scan. So the majority, okay. So here's a, a brief outline of what we're going to go through. We'll look at some of the biomechanics. Uh, we'll look at some of the safety, uh, some pearls, and then just uh, for completion on economics, um, in honor of Dr. Diab, um, we'll look at uh, cost comparison of how this plays out in this um, ever-expanding, expensive uh, spine surgery. From a biomechanical standpoint, um, I think it's pretty well known now that uh, you can get better curve correction uh, with pedicle screws in the thoracic spine than you can with hooks. And this has been shown in uh, uh, two studies, uh, largely by Souk, who was really um, forefront in bringing thoracic screws into uh, uh, correction. And then again by Linky, each showing that with pedicle screws, they could get a 70% correction versus hooks, which they got about 56 or 57 degrees. And obviously with Linky's study, they followed them out a little bit longer and showed that they tended to drift back a little bit um, toward, toward where they were before. You also get a better rotational correction um, of your of the apical vertebral body. Again, with the more powerful screws going into the anterior body, you can then kind of swing that back into place. When we look at the monoaxial versus um, uh, multi-axial screws, um, in a recent study um, by Linky and Pauly, they basically showed that in their 35 patients, they had improved apical rib hump, improved apical vertebral body ratio, and improved apical rib spread distance. Um, again, basically the, the summary of that is that they had superior derotation and restoration of the thoracic symmetry, um, which basically gave a more cosmetic profile. And uh, the assumption would then be possibly you could actually uh, help with their um, pulmonary function, although that, that was not actually uh, looked at in this particular study. When you look at the pullout strength of a pedicle claw versus a screw, um, it's actually more superior. So again, when you're looking at kyphosis, if you actually have a claw around the vertebral body, you have a lot more purchase than you do with threads, whether it be a, a five, six, seven, whatever millimeter pedicle screw, where those threads can pull out. So therefore, in a kyphosis correction, you still may want to have, uh, you may still want to consider using um, a hook or a claw to basically help prevent um, junctional kyphosis or, or uh, pull out of that screw. So now we kind of come to safety, and this is kind of the unanswered question uh, that kind of has made thoracic pedicle screws in the past very controversial, and I think it continues to largely because of lack of definition. So on the, the CT scan on the left, um, is, that, is this particular screw safe? Um, let's see, where's the mouse? Is this guy safe or is he unsafe? Who would change it? Who wouldn't? Um, versus the other one where you say, well, the hooks, 
but is that a really a safe construct either? That one's going to have complications as well. And obviously that's an older film, so you know, hooks can be used differently. Just 10 years ago, uh, Alex Vaccaro said that the placement of screws in the thoracic pedicles should only be attempted if overall stability of the spine is critical. So clearly, um, this mantra has changed based on the audience who, 10 years later, everybody's putting thoracic pedicle screws in. Uh, back in the mid-90s, nobody really was, or minimal people were. And I think the bottom line is, uh, when we look through the studies, is that safety is not uh, well defined. Uh, the key is complications or risk of complications. And that, again, is, is ill-defined as far as what is safe and what is not safe. So is it really safe to drive 100 miles an hour? Well, it depends on what and where you're driving. And it's the same thing with the screws um, with different factors at different levels and different degrees of safety profiles. <clears throat> when we look at the studies comparison, uh, comparing screws versus hooks, a perfectly placed pedicle screw has no, um, has no canal compromise whatsoever. However, if we compare it to hooks and look at a laminar hook, if you have a 5.5 millimeter screw, and it violates the canal by 1.5 millimeters, that's actually the equivalent penetration of what you would have with a small pedicle hook. And with a three millimeter penetration, that's actually equal to what you would have with a large pedicle hook. So just because the, the screw may skirt the medial cortex and come on the inside, it still may not be more of a violation than you would actually have with a hook. When we look at large laminar hooks, um, these fill the canal 94.2 millimeters cubed, and if it's misplaced, that can be up to 120 millimeters cubed, which is actually larger than the size if you have the entire screw within the cortex. So uh, again, it may not be a big deal to actually have some uh, violation. And when we look back at Gertzbein studies and some of the earlier studies, they defined an unsafe screw as more than two to four millimeters of violation into the canal. But again, I think that's very variable based on, on, your, on the, whether you're on the convex or the concave side, whether you're up at the high thoracic, mid thoracic, or at the apex of the curve. When we look at, again, through the papers, basically the misplaced pedicle screw is anywhere from 3 to 25 percent. Again, that's very variable based on how you define this. When we look at Suk's uh, large study in uh, deformity uh, patients, he only had a 0 0.8 percent complication with three dural tears, one transient paraparesis, but no long-term uh, complications. In our study here at Harborview, we had no neurological or major complications, but we did have three patients that went back to the operating room to have their screws changed, largely thought to be uh, potentially a compromise or too close to the, the large vessels of the esophagus. So I think the big controversies that are still out there that um, continue to be discussed through the literature with very ill-defined uh, safety profiles is how medial, how lateral, how long, how close can you be to structures, and at what point you actually need to have uh, a screw changed. And then the other issues that are arising are, do you fire screws based on anatomical landmarks? Do you use fluoroscopy? Do you use some sort of navigational system to fire your screws? <clears throat> some anatomical pearls that seem to be repeated um, through the literature is that uh, there's a few things to keep in mind, is that when you have a right thoracic curve, beware of the aorta that can be actually right up against the lateral cortex. So you may want to be particularly careful at those levels of a lateral cortical violation. The other thing is that the medial pedicle cortex is about two to three times thicker than the lateral cortex. And so as you're using your pedicle finder or whatever device you're using, um, if you kind of rub off the medial cortex, they're usually fa fairly thick, and you should be able to feel if there's actually a medial, medial cortical violation, which is not necessarily true with the lateral cortex. The other thing is that the concave pedicles are, tend to be smaller than the convex pedicles, and the cord tends to be draped over those pedicles. So whereas on the convex side, you can actually have some uh, um, violation of the canal, on the concave side, you want to be, be a bit more careful. And then as Kim's uh, study in spine 2005, you want to be able to look on your AP image, again, the AP of the vertebral body, not an AP with regard to the body, uh, the patient's body to determine where your ideal screw placement is. And again, you want it starting sort of at the lateral border of the pedicle, and you want it to be just off of midline, kind of as you see in this particular picture right here. Um, again, you want to be worried about a, a medial cortical violation with, uh, the screw, with the one in the middle and lateral with the one on the side. From a cost comparison standpoint, and I was just talking about this with uh, Mohammed Diab, um, Certainly, you can put screws at every level. If you use a monoaxial screw, this is going to be $630, roughly, depending on what system you use, per screw. If you use hooks, they're going to be cheaper. If you use polyaxial screws, they can be relatively expensive. So as you're trying to balance um, what you're going to be using uh, in your thoracic spine, 
Um, do you need a screw at every level? Can you compromise uh, and leave screws out? Should you use hooks? And these are some of the issues that are still out there. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. That'll certainly bring up uh, some interesting uh, dialogue about the cost. Our final uh, party is going to be on spondylolisthesis, and uh, Randy Chess is going to come up and uh, give that section. Well, I guess this will be a continuation of a uh, discussion that we sort of started at lunch for those of you who attended the, uh, the lunch session. Um, I threw a couple questions in here, but we kind of addressed them, so I think I'll skip through the first couple of slides here. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm going to do is to essentially uh, uh, work uh, by re reductio ex absurdum. I'd like to start with the high-grade slips and work backwards, because I think the physiology and the, art, the discussion c is easiest to understand at the high-grade slips, and then we can extrapolate that to the lower-grade slips. Um, we've talked a bit about slip angle, the angle of incidence of L5. We know that high slip angle is associated with higher instability increased risk of uh, progression of deformity, and increased risk of pseudoarthrosis after surgery. We've also talked about sacral incidence or pelvic in, uh, or sacral uh, uh, inclination or uh, pelvic incidence. We know that it's certainly higher in people with higher grade deformities, and we certainly know that, that the, uh, uh, the long-term effects um, on uh, fusion seem to be similar uh, and, to, and additive to the... Uh, the slip angle. And, and it makes sense when you think about gravity, the, the great kyphosing force in life. Um, if you look at two different, different uh, pelvic incidences and you look at the effect of gravity on those and you look at the vectors that, that induce the anterior slip, you can certainly see that with an increased pelvic incidence, the, 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 the angle, the horizontal vector is much higher. So in terms of progression, Slip angle, pelvic incidence are things that you have to keep in mind, not only for, for who needs to be corrected, but perhaps for what kind of correction you're shooting for. Sacral incidence increases shear through the segment and increases hyperlordosis in adjacent segments and compensation, another aspect of this disease that's often overlooked. It's a fairly complex disease. We have what everyone thinks about is that anterior displacement of the vertebral body. We have the rotation of the body, particularly as it goes into higher grades. We have the pelvic incidence or sacral in inclination that contributes to long-term instability. We have deformation of the adjacent vertebral uh, end plates, which uh, certainly plays a lot of role in access to the, that level and in inner body grafting. And then we have the compensatory hyperlordosis, which is uh, the patient's response to the sagittal imbalance. Now, these all come to us in the form of a patient. Patient presents clinically with a crouched gait, neural deficit more often in adults, tight hamstrings more often in kids, prominent spinous process step off, lumbar hyperlordosis with trunk shortening and back pain. And a lot of those are observable uh, uh, when, you, when you examine the patient. Mechanically, there's also a lot of aspects. The increased risk of progression in pseudoarthrosis are associated with high slip angle, increased sacral inclination, and increased sacral kyphosis. If we do not reduce those, we can't correct most of those. We can treat a neurodeficit. We can take off the prometry of the, the, the I mean, we can take off the dome of the, the sacrum. Uh, we can decompress the nerve roots, and we can fuse the patient. And certainly, neurodeficit can get better, and back pain can get better. But the mechanical aspects are not treated by non-reduction, and neither are necessarily the, the postural. Um, so we end up with a complex situation that can certainly be stabilized a number of ways. Why would we want to reduce these? Well, the short-term consequences of lack of reduction include fusion failure, instrumentation failure, and progression. The long-term consequences of lack of reduction are more controversial, and the question is the slow progression due to remodeling of fusion and the long-term consequences of the abnormal neural, co neural course. And this is something I think that is really the, an unknown and unreported part of what we do. Um, we'll talk about a little bit that a, bit, a bit more later, but the real ins uh, the issue is, is, as we've discussed with the, the uh, 
the treatment of uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, what happens longer down the line? We correct pulmonary function up front. What happens when your reserve starts to decline due to senescence? And then your lack of reserve certainly comes to the fore. Well, what happens over 20, 30, 40 years of abnormal anatomy with a solid union but an anatomically unfavorable position? Now, Spondylolisthesis reduction has certainly been reported, and we talked about that at noon. This is Serena Hu's study with Dave Bradford. 16 patients reduced with the Edwards swing set. Um, Post-op neuro deficits in 3 of 16, so 18% early deficits. Only one didn't resolve. Uh, instrumentation revision required a lot. I think that was related to the Edwards instruments. But most of the patients did fairly well with, with reduction of high-grade slips. Norbert Bose uh, report, 10 patients with high-grade slips, no postoperative neuro deficits, despite reduction. No hardware failure for those with ALIF, which I think is critical, and that's certainly been discussed here over and over. Um, and also a part of scoliosis surgery that is under, underwritten, underanalyzed uh, when you come to results. Um, he, if he did it uh, posterior alone, he had 83% hardware failure. Larson reported 13 patients with high-grade slips. They did an ALF and posterior lateral fusion, follow-up 28 months. No postoperative neurologic deficits, again, no, no L5 nerve root problems, and a, a, a very acceptable outcome. So the influence of reduction in high-grade slips is effective in reducing predictors of progression, and it seems, if you go to the literature, the neurologic deficit's overestimated. Now, it may well be that people don't like report it, reporting foot drops after surgery. I certainly don't. But, and, and so we may actually way underestimate that because the rumor is if you do high-grade reduction, you get foot drops. But if you go to the literature, it's actually pretty hard to find. Now, necessarily, it sounds like, from, from sort of reading through the literature, that in, if you're going to do it, you need rigid instrumentation, not quite the Chuck Edwards instrumentation, and supplemented with some type of anterior column support from the back or from the front. Uh, an interesting meta-analysis done in Ithmix lumbar spondy, and it wasn't really a meta-analysis because it, they didn't actually go back to get the actual data, and only three of the 34 uh, papers were RCTs. But they looked at union and clinical success for posterior fusion alone, anterior fusion alone, and combined fusion alone control for, control for instrumentation, trying to look at the influence of anterior either standalone or combined. And this is a pretty busy slide, but what they found was that both in terms of radiographic fusion and clinical results, you did better if you got anterior support, and either anterior and posterior or anterior standalone. And again, when you look at the Cochrane reports and the write-ups on whether or not you should instrument these people, none of those papers involved had anterior column support. So, so with the cases we're doing in the year 2006, I'm not sure that those reports are relevant to our modern surgical approach. In general, the highest rate of radiographic fusion and successful clinical outcomes were associated with combined surgical approaches that addressed both the anterior column and the posterior stability. And so it doesn't, didn't, didn't seem to really matter what the, the, the structure was in the short term, but it did appear to matter if you got something in between the body so that this construct should have a better patient satisfaction and radiographic fusion than this construct. Now, sagittal balance, again, I don't think we need to talk about this. We've certainly been over it a lot. Um, we know that the body tries to compensate, and we've seen that already in the high-grade slips with the hyperlordosis. They either try to compensate within the spine with that hyperlordosis or, as noted earlier, uh, below the spine. The, is sagittal balance important? We, we certainly talked about that. When you look at predictor of patient satisfaction, uh, the Bridwell study, uh, suggested that undercorrection was highly correlated with patient dissatisfaction. The, again, the, the Bourbon study, looking at AP corrections for sagittal plane deformity, patient satisfaction correlated most with restoration of num lo normal lumbar lordosis. And finally, uh, the, the SRS report in 2004, multi-center study, uh, 725 consecutive patients, 325 with positive sagittal balance, the conclusions that even mild positive imbalance was detrimental, and there was a linear relation with progressive lumbar sagittal imbalance and severity of symptoms. So if we are going to try to correct these, we would try to think that we need to correct the, the sagittal balance. Now this is the best paper in terms of long-term outcome <coughs> in high-grade slips. It was from Scandinavia, I mean from Finland. They looked at 22 patients, young patients, they reduced 11 in situ. Now, it's a retrospective study. They tried to match them, but they matched them for slip. 
And you can see they didn't match them perfectly because the reduced ones were higher grade. <coughs> um, now, the mean age at follow-up, despite it was a long follow-up, was 30 years. So these are still fairly young people. They argued that the outcome was actually slightly better in the non-reduced patients. Um, they don't have baseline data because it was a retrospective study. And actually, none of the patients actually reported very much back pain. So probably what they can say is there's no outcome difference. If you look anatomically, however, the corrections were much better, and the maintenance of those corrections were much, much better, significantly so in terms of slip, and in terms of the kyphosis, um, not significant, but quite a bit, 10 degrees difference. <coughs> Excuse me. So there, the longest term follow-up certainly looks like it's different anatomically. The complications were about the same. They actually had more traction perineal plexopathies due to large inner body grafts than they had L5 palsies due to the reduction. Um, is there a difference in outcome? Very questionable. We don't actually have data. There's certainly better anatomic restoration. And is there a difference in neurologic injury? Not according to that study. So what happens as you get older and older? Hopefully they will follow these patients so we'll have that information. But clearly, the only way to correct the sagittal imbalance is reduction. Now, if we look at lower grade slips, can we reduce this backwards and talk about the same thing? Is the restoration of anatomy important? Realigning the spine does involve segments above the lesion, improves posture, and avoids increased stress on adjacent segments. And certainly, that when you reduce people like this, you can see the lordosis, the, the sacral in incidence will correct, the lordosis will correct. That is not possible without reduction. When we talk about opening the neural foramina, if you don't reduce this, if you fuse it in situ, you can see that when you look at the native and the postoperative neural foramen, there's a big difference. If you do reduce those, you can restore the, the neural foramen. Does that make a difference? I have no idea. But it's easier to talk to a patient that didn't get better that has this neural foramen than this neural foramen. Finally, if we're going to talk about realigning the aesthetic segments, it certainly approves the ability for us to get a graft in the inner body space from the front or the back if we've realigned it. That's a simple aspect, but we're, we're stressing anterior inner body fusion. And if that's a part of your fusion, particularly from the back, it's so much easier to put a graft in a realigned body than a non-realigned body. It increased operative time and blood loss, well, actually the reduction doesn't take all that long in the low grades. So I'm not sure how much. It, it takes an average of probably 10 to 15 minutes, and I don't know how much difference in blood loss that, that results. In the literature, they quote 0 to 18% of complications. That's what's in chapters. But when you try to find the references for those, it's quite difficult. Um, I actually don't know where the data is, and I'm unable to find it on low-grade slips. I'm going to skip that slide. With modern instrumentation and techniques, reduction is a lot easier. Um, for instance, if you're going to do it with just a simple system, you can just overdrive the upper screw put the, so that there's a step off, put the rod in, lock the rod down, and leave that step off. And then you can simply use a reduction tool, such as the complex reduction forceps in this case, to distract on this rod and pull it up so that you get a reduction. That doesn't actually take very long. The only important thing is, is to make sure that you have enough space in that respect to get the reduction. If your post-reduction film doesn't look right, you can, you can do a little bit of a discectomy, do a little decompro decompression approach, take the rod out, swing it medially, turn the screw down, and replace the rod and get more reduction. So if you need to stage it, you can certainly do that. Um, this is a, a young male with a mobile slip that was rapidly progressive who was corrected in just that way. First, he was reduced actually to a bent rod. And then eventually it was swapped out for a straight rod, and he went on to a, a pretty solid union with a very short construct. But he was really loose. But you can do that very easily with not much time using the same instruments you'd use for a standard fusion. This is the way we did that lady we discussed this afternoon, threaded shan screws, so that there, there is a thread along the usually smooth bore of the shan screw. Those are placed into the adjacent bodies. And then there's a threaded reduction sleeve 
and a, uh, a knurled rod to drive the reduction sleeve. It fits on the end. And you can just put that over, that over the rod and turn it down. And as you turn it down, it reduces this slowly but surely up onto the rod. And you can do that over time. You can do it balanced. In the longer constructs, you can do a couple of them at a time using distraction along the way to readjust the body using continuous uh, monitoring of your, your nerve roots. I think it's a safe way to get a partial reduction or if you get carried away and you have a resident standing there wanting a good x-ray to get full reduction. And I will admit that this afternoon's film had a lot to do with Feng Yijang going, oh, come on, we do some more. Um, it, against probably my better judgment. But you can get good, re I mean, the point is that nowadays with the modern instrumentation, you can get good reduction and you can do it fairly simply. It's not that it's necessary, but I think the arguments that it's not a good idea when looked at strongly are unclear and, and aren't as strong as we think of them. Um, why do it? Relatively simple. It improves the biomechanics. The incidence of root injury is unclear, but it's probably lower than we think. And it aids inner body fusion. And then what happens in the 20 plus year deterioration, I can't help but be struck by the patients I see coming back to see me at 20, 30 years out, who now are starting to have trouble again. And I can't figure out, they have a solid union, they look a little worse by angles, but I can't figure out what to do for them. I don't see the ones coming back who, who were reduced. Uh, that is not an, a, a, a scientific study, but more and more it's starting to be that patient that I'm seeing back. And then in the long run, in the absence of evidence, consider aesthetics. If this is the spine that presents to you, what x-rays do you want to stare at when you get up in the morning? Thank you very much. Well, it reminds me that I, I gave that paper in uh, 1990 in British Columbia at the SRS and was almost laughed out of the... Uh, place and uh, it's wonderful to see the convergence on that uh, common thinking now that spinal anesthesis is in fact a reducible uh, a reducible uh, project and uh, at a reasonably low risk. Mm -hmm.